The modern attack surface is vast and permeable, extending from the data center to the cloud and device edge. Security teams are stretched thinner and thinner as they try to cover this ground. The result? More high-profile breaches hit the news every day. Don't let your organization be next. ExtraHop delivers security from the inside out, helping enterprise security teams detect threats up to 95% faster and cut staff time to resolve by two-thirds or more. Act with confidence. Learn more at extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences NextGen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps toolchain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, we will, of course, be at InfoSec World April 1st through the 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort. I will be uh, presenting there. We will be doing some hacker trivia. We'll be doing briefings, interviews. Uh, Tony is still with us. Tony Cole from Ativo Networks. Tony, you'll be there at. Uh, is this your first I Infosec will. World, or have you been uh, in the past? I've been in the past, but uh, I it was an Infosec conference with Misty, and I'm not sure if it was the same one because mm. I think it was at Georgetown University the last okay. one we went to. Yeah, this is their big cybersecurity one. They do a lot of the uh, other events uh, in the auditing community and such. So, yeah, it's gonna be a good time. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Do we have a we have a discount code as well? I think for Infosec World. Yes, it's OS nineteen dash Sec Week. Get you fifteen percent off. So make sure you register and use the discount code. Uh, in the enterprise security news, New Star is has made an acquisition. A few, uh, quite a few acquisitions uh, were announced in the past uh, week or so. Uh, New Star being one of them, with uh, delving into the fraud detection, which is a uh, it's kind of it's an offshoot of security. I wouldn't say it's a straight cybersecurity play, but it's definitely an offshoot and in uh, a category and or industry that is very well funded. There's a lot of companies in it. I think that you know when we talk about uh, detecting fraud, uh, there's some pretty high rates of success uh, that companies have applying to technology to uh, detect fraud because it's a I think a much smaller uh, scope because you're dealing with very finite transactions in a lot of cases. So uh, interesting that Newstar is going to play in this space now as well. Yeah, it was kind of a – Newstar is one of those weird Franken companies. Mm -hmm. They they do all kinds of different stuff. I, I still think that their, uh, uh, their DNS services are probably their main bread and butter, but this, yep. is, this is just kind of an odd uh, pickup, I guess. It is a, a, a weird pickup, right, because they're DDoS prevention, DNS – and a couple of other services in there, um, so it's interesting that they're adding fraud into the into the mix. I, it must. It's yeah. so hard to I would say to manage. I mean, as we look at cybersecurity companies, right? A anytime there's they're in like these multiple areas, it's hard to have that cohesive story. You know, um, about which services do you use? What problem do you solve? It's like, well, we're in four different areas. You know, we solve four <laughs> different problems, and the story becomes difficult to tell. Well, and we always like there's a lot of times whenever we see a company partner or purchase another company, we just basically say that makes sense. The mm -hmm. two products go together, you know, peanut butter and jelly. It absolutely makes sense. But sometimes it just seems like they're just acquiring a company for no real cohesive reason that we can see on the outside. Right. Yeah, sometimes it just feels like there's no theme, you know, to what they're actually offering to focus on a specific set of problems that they can resolve for a customer. So and yeah. uh, I, I think that's a, a lot of the large security vendors as well today. Yeah, yeah, and we've got a couple of those as well. Uh, Sophos is buying uh, a cloud security company, um, which and, isn't this like their fifth this year so far? Yeah, and it, I mean to speak to Tony's point, what what I observe is larger companies buy smaller, more innovative, or you know, innovation in smaller companies, and then like the classic CA example, which is not CA today, it's a very different organization in, in a lot of different You could still aspects. use Cisco or a number of other companies right? as examples, right? And, and it, it's like, what happens to it? It's like in a lot of these startups, as we, as we say, uh, in a lot of them, some of them are even late stage startups, you're like, they had great technology. And a lot of them are on our radar to be, you know, sponsors and partners with the show because they have great uh, innovation and they're solving a, a problem that people have. 
And I'm like, that's awesome. And then they get acquired, but then I don't hear anything. And it, it saddens me that the larger companies well, uh, move so slow to get their messaging. And, 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 and I talk to customers, like if you're, if you were to talk to uh, you Sofa as an example, and this could not be the case, but let's just say it is the case where I'm a Sophos customer, they bought a cloud security company, even six months or a year later, they'll come to me with a problem. And I'm like, well, you have Sophos and <laughs> they bought that company that solves that problem. And they're like, <laughs> what, what happened? They're that? like, yeah, I think we saw that announcement, but we have no idea. Like Sophos never came to us and said anything, you know, and oh, it, I, there's that I, disconnection. I do see where Cisco does better than most, right? You know, when Cisco mm -hmm. bought Sourcefire, you can definitely yeah. see that direct transition. Yeah. Transition. Mm -hmm. Cisco, um, you know, it, it seems to be uh, whenever they bought OpenDNS, we can see that direct kind of correlation, yeah. how one fed into the other. And they never really seem to completely destroy the identity of the company that they purchased. It, a lot of times it stays and they, they have no problem saying open DNS is now with Cisco. Look, right. we got umbrella and Talos and all that stuff. So some seem to do it much better than others. Well, it's interesting, Tony, you've been in a lot of acquisitions and I, in your experience, like what are the best ways that larger companies can bring to market and uh, promote the acquired company to their existing customers? I feel like a lot of organizations struggle with that today. I would agree with you, and I think it's really important for companies to realize, you know, um, not that the technology is good that they're buying, uh, that the numbers look good, that it's the right people that you want, but why are you buying them? Yeah. What, you know, uh, gap in your portfolio does it fill, and how are you going to actually build that into your own messaging so that your own sales team is enabled so exactly what you just stated doesn't happen? So they bought this company, they came to us and actually solved a problem <laughs> for us. Because in our field, you know, if, if you're not solving problems, you know, why you in, why are you in it, right? Right. So, and there's too many companies today that are, you know, uh, focused on numbers and numbers alone versus actually uh, countering something that is, you know, really decimating, you know, companies and, and governments around the globe. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I've seen time and time again, uh, you know, acquiring really cool technology. You know, Palo Alto, I think, has acquired some great technology. Uh, and just hasn't put together that it included it in their cohesive messaging, as as Tony said, right? <clears throat> and yeah. we need to get better at that, in my opinion. Um, let's see. Uh, also, Radware has acquired Shield Square. It sounds to me like Shield Square Never has heard of Shield Square. I haven't either. And not, yeah, a lot either. of these vendors. Okay, in so the, it's not just me. Yeah, okay. and I think they're they're in there with like Distill and isn't there they're an Australian company that I can't think of I think the name they're, of. They're trying to stop like that bot the bot problem uh, where yeah. they're scraping websites and pulling data. You know, they, yeah. they kind of try to thread that line between what's a malicious bot and a legitimate bot because like Microsoft, right? M MSN bot, Google bot, those would be legitimate bots. But if your competitor is scraping pricing information, that would be bad. So this is a huge area for companies. It's just I've never heard of this company before. Yeah. And, I, you know, Radware is saying they're going to integrate it into their WAF, which in my mind is the correct uh, application for that. If you've got, I mean, and so the... Think, shouldn't your WAF already be doing this, though? I mean... It's a great point, John. You it's would a, think. It's a great point. If you do have a WAF, it should uh, be taking into account some of that bot activity, right? But there's a yeah. lot of research that I think goes into it. It all depends on how well it's integrated, but it does make sense. If you've got some kind of web application... Um, gateway if it were or some kind of protection right you want it to be able to handle bots rather than going out and buying some kind of rasp or uh, other technology and going out and buying some other kind of bot detection and then trying to integrate them manually it'd be nice if it was in one cohesive package because it's it's a great fit i think a lot of the benefit on the surface is if you're taking out all that bot traffic, now what you're analyzing is actual real traffic, um, and you can do a better job of that. That's just you know something I've observed about these technologies recently. So, but Radware is another gigantic company, and another one yeah. I I struggle to figure out all the things that they do. Um, yeah, because they're so big. Uh, Akamai is made an identity management uh, acquisition. Speaking of large companies that do a lot of a lot of different things. <laughs> Uh, and Akamai's play into the security space is, is kind of a weird one for me. I, don't, I hear a lot of mixed feedback. Um, I think they're a great CDN company. That's how I've always recognized their name. I remember even, uh, you know, 15 plus years ago, I, they were in data centers 
uh, that I was managing and always recognized as a great CDN, mm-hmm. their security play is just kind of weird. I'm not sure well, you know, how they've you know, carved out their niche there. It, it's strange. Um, from like, like I know some of the people at Akamai fairly well, a lot of the stuff that you see come out of Akamai as far as products are things that they develop internally for their own use. Right. And then somebody says, hey, we can market this and sell it, which is, it's an interesting approach. It's pretty cool. Um, with this, I've heard rumors from a number of people that are coming out with a, like an application layer VPN solution at some point um, in 2019 that's pretty neat. And I see this purchase as basically going to be trying to tie in with whatever VPN solution that they're going to be releasing. So this one actually does kind of make sense um, to me. But like I said, Akamai really, you know, knowing a lot of the people there, they're really a good, solid tech company with a lot of really, really amazing technical engineers doing amazing work. And I, I, I don't know, sometimes I see these things just kind of as an offshoot without really a lot of direction of where they want to go, where they want to be. They're just like, hey, this is cool. Check it out. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just kind of their way of doing things. Mm. I, I would agree. I've always been really impressed with the people I know at Akamai and have been in their sock a number of times. Uh, but I think it goes back to the uh, conversation we were having earlier where you really need a cohesive strategy and what you're going to do. It's great to enable mm-hmm. your technical people so they're still being creative and driving things. But how does that fit in with your goals for actual uh, penetration in the market and solving problems? And if it's not yeah. a component of it, then it's something they shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And I also know Akamai is in the class of company. Whenever a, comp- a, a smaller company comes in and does a product pitch, they absolutely have meetings and they say, can can we can we build this internally cheaper than actually buying the product or even buying the entire company. So sometimes their acquisition strategy is we could be their customer or we could just own them. And mm. man, I'd love to have that as a series of problems and solutions. Right. I'd love to have that in like a decision Apple? tree. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or who bought who bought Squirrel? Was it uh, uh, H- it was Amazon was it bought Squirrel? Amazon. Oh, yeah, it was Amazon. I think Amazon yeah. bought Squirrel. Niara was <laughs> the HP one. Yeah. Yep, there you go. Uh, speaking of that would surprise me. Yeah, yeah, it surprised a lot of people. Yes, <laughs> actually, I'm surprised Amazon isn't making more strategic security acquisitions. Um, God, but they released four different new product lines and services per week. Dear God. Yeah. I mean, how do you? Yeah. It's, well, just like John said, Amazon is is one of those companies. Just like Akamai, they like to build things themselves when they can on the security side. They build a yeah, lot of their agreed. own tools. Yep. Yeah, they hire some really amazing talent. So yeah, they do. Now, in acquisitions, um, we talk about BlackBerry, who acquired Silence. And it's so weird. And it, but it, yes, because I mean, again, the perception of BlackBerry uh, is you know the loss of market share on the smartphone <laughs> side. Um, but so I I think what the announcement is is Silence had some kind of IoT security platform. And that's mm-hmm. what BlackBerry is now making available as a product? I, it's, I think it was something that was almost done and BlackBerry is moving it. But it's just amazing because you're seeing BlackBerry with this and the silence. They're making a, a one hell of a pivot mm-hmm. um, to, to the security space. And God bless them for doing it. Um, but I don't know, like, how long is it going to take for people to think of BlackBerry as a security company instead of like a failed mobile device company? It's, it's I true. will tell you that reading on uh, stock twits well over a year, maybe even two years ago, and people were talking about how BlackBerry was, you know, a powerhouse cybersecurity company. So and, and it's probably people, you know, uh, trying to actually pump, pump the stock up. But I mean, literally, yeah. I would look at it and like, what are they talking about? Yep. So it was very interesting when uh, they acquired Silence to me. So definitely trying to pivot hard. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think this is this to me is a hard sell in, in my observation of the IoT market, even before it was called IoT. Um, that what they're marketing and Microsoft is marketing with uh, a product called Azure Sphere is not to the consumers of these devices or products. And consumers could be like a consumer as an individual who is putting it in their home, or consumers of an enterprise. Uh, or industrial control systems that are using IoT devices. It's the people who are making the IoT devices that would need to adopt in Microsoft Azure Sphere as an example, that architecture and build their product on an architecture. This article seems to hint at similar things that I would adopt BlackBerry, now BlackBerry's platform, 
to build my secure IoT infrastructure. Now that has to interface with the hardware, with the kernel and the software and the firmware on the device, as well as the cloud and the mobile apps. Um, and so we very much need a platform that can allow people to build a secure uh, ecosystem for their IoT devices, right? Because if you think about you know, Ring is a good example, right? They've got the app, yeah. they've got the device. They're actually really good at pushing security down through their, a platform that they've built. But now you have a larger company like Microsoft or BlackBerry that's funding this secure platform. They've got to sell it to the manufacturers. Some of these manufacturers are startups. Some of them are in very competitive markets where price is a huge deal, such as your home router, right? People are buying yeah. what's cheapest, not necessarily what's most secure. I mean, that could change, um, but I, I think it's a tough but sell. This is this is something I, I, I hesitate to ask this question because I'm I'm sure I'm going to get flamed um, by asking it. But whenever I see all of this product focus on botnets, and whenever we read the news stories and the press releases, they say IoT is one of the most important things in computer security. And it's kind of springboarding off of what you just said, Paul. The issues that we've had in IoT, like Mirai and these mm -hmm. botnets and DDoS attacks, they're consumer side, right? Like an organization mm -hmm. trying to defend themselves against the IoT threat, it, it seems like you're buying a product to secure the IoT devices in your environment, but your main risk may be a DOS attack from a botnet of IoT devices that are refrigerators like you and I have to, you know, you know, Malibu Stacy dolls that swear whenever they get infected. But right. the point is, I feel like the solutions that are coming out for IoT security actually don't address the major security issues that we have seen in the past 12, 18 months involving IoT. So sometimes this feels to me like people are throwing money at IoT security because it's in the news without actually understanding truly what the solutions are actually doing and how do those actually match up vis-a-vis -vis the actual attacks that we've seen? Mm -hmm. Or am I missing something here? I would agree with you. In fact, I think it's, it's problematic. If you go in and you just look at what any consumer can buy to secure their home today, just on the consumer side. You know, it's it's really sad. You know, there are so few decent products that actually provide any capability to actually defend an environment in an mm. autonomous uh, nature because, you know, most consumers are not going to know what they're doing. They want to buy something, turn it on, and get connected. So when you add the IoT piece in there as well that you just talked about, John, just from that consumer side, that's a massive problem. And then you take, you know, a 5G coming into place and ubiquitous high-speed connectivity and the problems are going to get tremendously worse in two years. I, yeah, but Tony, that, I mean, products, that's that's scary for me. None of these products are going to solve that, yeah, right? Yeah, because no, it, I agree. if you think of IoT in the home today, many of the problems are that the IoT devices you have in your home are exposed to the internet in some way, right? Either the user has done that or they put it out somehow outside the firewall or Universal plug and play, as the most recent uh, news articles came through, has opened up those firewall rules. And you can go to Shodan and find all these IoT devices. And of course, attackers are finding all new ways to play videos on your uh, you know, Chromecast, which we covered uh, yesterday. But the, the thing is, when we have 5G, like where's your, if it's got a SIM card in it, where's your firewall on that? Now I think what Tony's saying is more of these devices are going to be exposed to the internet, which is going to make the problem even worse than it is today. We've already got Mirai infecting devices today. And most home users have some type of firewall. And sure, they, a percentage of them misconfigure it. But what happens when all these are just directly connected to the internet? It's terrifying. It really is. And then, you know, for some of these, I, I just, I still laugh. You know, oh, I can stand at my fridge and start my washing machine. Uh, couldn't you just push start when you were up there actually loading soap and clothes in it? So uh, some of it is just ridiculous that uh, what people are building. So uh, it, it, it's going to be fascinating. We did a study uh, for the Instac years ago, 2014. So and it was um, IoT and SCADA systems. So and uh, the security of them as it impacts national security and emergency preparedness. And we had a whole bunch of experts come in, you know, focused specifically in that area for the better part of a year. And the, the report is public on the DHS website now and recommended to the government what they should do to actually counter some of this before we got too far down the IoT adoption road. And unfortunately, it fell pretty much on deaf ears and very little has been done in that space. So if we don't get the manufacturers on board solving some of these challenges, maybe BlackBerry Silence can help, You know, then I think we're gonna be in a world of hurt in two years. Absolutely. 
Um, I think the last article was uh, Pratigo Labs uh, is promoting serverless security with an open source project. And uh, while I was hoping this was going to be something more to help defend serverless applications, it's actually a vulnerable serverless application which that you can use to is test beautiful. with. beautiful. Which is, is not. I mean, I'm not this you know, knocking them for that. But that's, I mean, it's good. I just, I would like to see more no, in the realm of open source security software that's helping protect containers and serverless, but having a vulnerable but it platform starts to with test. This. Sure, absolutely. But it starts with this. And a huge amount of props to Protego um, for releasing a product that helps re kind of increase awareness around a specific problem. Yes. And this is beautiful for a wide variety of reasons. If people are doing pen testing and they want to understand mm. how, these different, how these different types of uh, containers and things can be attacked, this is where you're going to go learn. If you're implementing this technology and want to stand the vulnerability in the attack space, this is where you're going to go learn service, uh, how to attack serverless applications. This is beautiful because it's helping us as an industry as a whole develop better understanding of what the vulnerabilities actually are. Because you and I have said many times there are products out there that have solutions for this. And they're like, hey, we've got a solution for this problem. And whenever I'm testing these products or BHIS is testing these products, it's very, very, very clear to me that most of these vendors have no idea what the actual attacks actually look like. Mm. So this is going to help increase the awareness. It's got mm. a platform where new vulnerabilities can be added to it. And for the company that developed this, Protego, they're going to be one of the first companies that people think of whenever they start thinking of securing these solutions because this is where they actually learned. So this is just amazing and it fits in beautifully with what's something we like to see a lot. Release something open source to the community or freemium. And then, you know, that's how you get people hooked into your product and to understanding. So I hope that everybody downloads this, plays with it, and learns as much as they can about these different attack surfaces because far too few security professionals actually know for sure what the attacks look like. What, what I find interesting is that serverless is very new and the vulnerabilities that we're discovering or that are applicable mm -hmm. to it are also very new. And one could yep. say that, well, you know, those are going to go away as we move forward. I think as everyone who listens to the show and everyone on the podcast <laughs> today knows that once a vulnerability is introduced in some technology, it likely never will never go thing. away. Right? <laughs> like you could have damn vulnerable web app written in PHP and talk about very simple cross-site scripting mm -hmm. or SQL injection. Hey, guess what? Those vulnerabilities still exist out there today. And so I, that to me is kind of scary in a way well, that like vulnerabilities, whether they're in configuration or actual bug and code somewhere, they tend to mm -hmm. stick around forever. Well, and let's look at uh, Damn Vulnerable Web App, right? Mm -hmm. When Damn Vulnerable Web App came out, it basically was highlighting the OWASP top 10, and it had those vulnerabilities baked into it. And over time, it continues to evolve and grow as people continue to support and contribute to the project. And having that platform for people to bring these different types of vulnerabilities and allow the platform to be a training environment moving forward or a learning environment is great. So this is a great first start, and this is something that we've desperately needed for a long time in this space. Absolutely. Uh, I agree 100%. I think it's a fantastic thing, and I, I, I like the model. I mean, uh, you look what Snort did so long ago, you know, uh, and, and created really a tremendous awareness of IPS that wasn't out there as people actually uh, started playing with Snort and turned into Sourcefire that Cisco acquired, but nevertheless gave people uh, the ability to play at home. And actually, still today, you know, uh, people still use Snort signatures and everything, so... I think it's critical to give that capability to the defenders out there to play and learn. Absolutely. Well, that will conclude this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. John, thank you very much. Tony, thank you very much uh, for sticking around for the entire show. Uh, it was nice having you on the program today. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.